so basically this is the important feature of the federation when it comes to federation there will be government at the two levels one is at the central level and the other is at the good morning students welcome back to plutus is so today we are in our 12th day in our 95 days uh, prelims challenge i hope you are getting uh, getting some useful information through this lectures and uh, you are finding them helpful right so today uh, we will discuss about the state government and council of ministers so here the chief minister chief minister is also become becomes a very component he is uh, he is the main important position here so today we will see and uh, understand the important aspects about the uh, government uh, basically the executive at the state level so our major focus will be on prime minister at the council of ministers and uh, the relations uh, relationship between the chief minister and the governor important role and responsibilities uh, of the chief minister and uh, similarly uh, in the end we will also see and uh, discuss something some things about the chief secretary chief secretary so this position is akin to the cabinet secretary cabinet secretary at the central level so similar way we have a chief secretary at the state level to assist the uh, council of ministers at the state level so we will see some uh, aspects about aspects about the chief secretary also right uh, before uh, directly going in, uh, going into the topic of state government we will try and understand the adjustment between the center and states when it comes to administration we will bri briefly try and understand the relation between the center and states and uh, the administrative arrangement between the center and state then we can better understand the uh, administrative structure at the state level right so uh, we will try and understand the some aspects of federation of india so the first art article of the constitution it says that india that is bharat shall be a union of states so basically india will be a union of states so here the word federation has been deliberately left out so basically uh, the constitution declares india as the union of states here the word federation federation deliberately omitted because the uh, the union is not formed uh, because of the agreement between the states here in india the union is uh, the federation the federal type of administration has been established for only administrative convenience administrative convenience right so in this way uh, the federation of india differs a greatly when it comes to the federation in the uh, united states of america there the word federation has been used used in the constitution itself right right so the indian constitution exhibits characteristic characteristics of both federation and a unitary system giving rise to a quasi federal polity so we have understood this uh, this aspect before before also basically we have a quasi federal system we can say half federation so the division of powers or the federal aspects are not clear i mean not watertight when it comes to the case of india so right so we will see a dual government here dual governments uh, means uh, two governments that is one government is at the union level and the other government is at the state level so we have governments at the two levels so basically this is the important feature of the federation when it comes to federation there will be government at the two levels one is at the central level and the other is at the state level and this division of powers between these two uh, i mean these two governments is mentioned in the constitution itself 
the constitution defines the powers of the center and the states so basically this is the framework of a federation however the word federation is not explicitly mentioned in the constitution so because of this uh, these all these reasons we are calling india as a quasi federal system so try to remember this aspect for all practical purposes india is a federation there is no doubt about it right similarly we have seen this uh, this aspect also there is distribution of powers between the center and states and the distribution is mentioned in the constitution itself so they are basically the seventh schedule uh, the seventh schedule mentions three uh, types of powers three lists of powers are there one belongs to center the other belongs to states and the third part is about concurrent list uh, on which the center and the states both can uh, execute the laws so basically this is the arrangement that is mentioned in the constitution so similarly there is supremacy uh, of constitution because the powers are distributed through the constitution itself so the, the the there is a supremacy of the constitution so similarly whenever there is a dispute arises there is a supreme court i mean the judiciary is there the supreme court is there it has the original jurisdiction of resolving the disputes between the center and states so all these features are the existing of a judiciary to address the disputes that are arising between the center and the states so this is also a federal feature right so these are basically the federal uh, federal features what are the federal features uh, dual government government existing at two levels and uh, distribution of powers through the constitution itself there is a division of powers uh, between the center and the state governments the third one is supremacy supremacy of the constitution so basically these uh, i mean the states and the center both are drawing their respective powers from the constitution itself and the fourth feature we can say the judiciary as the fourth fourth feature if there is any dispute between the center and the states there is a ju uh, judiciary to resolve those conflicts so these are basically the federal features now uh, let's try and understand the unitary features what are the features that are giving india a unitary nature first one is unified judicial system i mean there is a single structure of judiciary there is no separate judiciary for the center and for the state we have a unified judiciary right so in contrast when we see the usa the judicial system in usa it has separate judiciary right so the center center at the central level there is a separate judiciary and for each and every state there is separate judiciary right the second feature is integrated machinery right <clears throat> so there is a integrated machinery when it comes to conducting elections accounts and audit so basically the controller and auditor uh, general is there there is election commission for conducting elections and for accounts also we have consolidated fund of india etc etc so there are uh, common machinery integrated machinery is there to oversee the administrative aspects of the uh, center and states for example the election commission of india conducts elections for both center and for state governments also center for center and for states also the uh, the election uh, commission is the common body responsible for conducting elections third one is superintendent uh, superintendents and the control of the union government so for many aspects the union government controls or guides the state governments right so there is a uh, lot of communication channels and the channels through which the center can control the state government right similarly we can discuss some more aspects also here governor the position of governor the center appoints the governor at the state level and uh, the governor acts as the agent of the center at the state level similarly the provision for emergency powers right whenever a national emergency is imposed the uh, center takes the control of the state governments 
Similarly, whenever the state, I mean, president's rules, rule is also implemented, the center assumes the uh, administrative control over the state government. So there are several features which are unitary in nature when it comes to India. So, so basically, India is a blend of both the federal principles, federal features and unitary features. There, uh, there is a, I mean, the um, I mean, the concept of cooperative, cooperative federalism has arisen in India. So basically, Granville Austin is a constitutional expert. Con constitutional expert. He uh, called uh, Indian Federation as a cooperative federalism. Cooperative <coughs> federalism. We also call it as Quasi federalism means half federalism. So basically, close cooperation between the union and the state governments is essential for effective governance. So, because of this reason, uh, Granville Austin called Indian Federation as Cooperative Federation. So, now we will see the state administrative framework. How the constitution, I mean, in what way the constitution has given. Uh, for a administrative framework for the states. So generally, governance operates at the three levels, central level, state levels, and after the 73rd and the 74th constitutional amendments, there is administrative setup at local level also. Right. So basically, there are uh, government uh, governance operates at the three levels, central level, state level, and the local level. The constitution specifies the powers and functions at each level of the government. So, the functions and the powers are mentioned for each level in the constitution itself. Right. Union and the state governments function independently within their spheres because they have their own roles and responsibilities. However, there is some overlapping of responsibilities. So, just before we have discussed that, our federation, I mean, of our Federation is not a watertight federation. There is no watertight separation or distribution of power. So basically, there is some overlapping. Right. So this is the administrative setup that is given uh, in India. Right. So these are some of the uh, federal aspects uh, we have to understand before clearly understanding the setup at the state level. Right. Now we will see some important articles when it comes to administration or the government at the state level. So first one is article 154 says that executive power of the state vests in the governor. Uh, he can directly exercise his power or he can exercise these powers through the subordinate officer to him. Next is article 163. So the council of ministers uh, uh, with the chief minister, chief minister as its head <coughs> is there to aid and advise the governor. <coughs> Sorry. So basically, Article 163 says that there shall be a council of ministers headed by the chief ministers to aid and advise the governor when it comes to administrative, administrative matters, except there is some ex uh, exception. So, apart from the discretionary powers, there is Council of Ministers to aid and advise the Governor. So, uh, when it comes to discretionary powers, the Governor will take his own decisions. Right. Yesterday, we have understood the discretionary powers. Some of the dis uh, discretionary powers were like sending, uh, recommending President's rule in the state, etc. Sending a bi-weekly uh, bi report to the President about the administrative aspects of the state, etc. And similarly, appointing a chief minister when there is a hung assembly. So, these are some of the discretionary powers of the governor. Similarly, Article 164, <coughs> uh, it, the first provision is chief minister is appointed by the governor and based on the advice of the chief minister, other ministers will be appointed. Second one is council of ministers collectively responsible to the state legislative assembly. So, this is the principle, backbone of the parliamentary democracy. Parliamentary democracy. 
So at the central level we have this system. Similarly, we are following the same principle, uh, the parliamentary, the system of parliamentary democracy at the state level also. Because the council of ministers is responsible or accountable to the state legislative assembly, right? The third, uh, third one is uh, before assuming office, the chief ministers and other ministers will take oath, respective oath. Next important article is Article 166. So conduct of business of the government at the state level. So the governor makes rules for the uh, more convenient transaction of the business at the state government. So basically it uh, says about the power of the governor to make rules for smooth uh, transaction of uh, administration or business of the government at the state level. Article 167 uh, duty of the chief minister to communicate the decisions of the council of ministers to governor. Right. Basically, this article also defines the relationship between the governor and the chief minister. So, this becomes very, very important article. Similarly, article 168, it uh, says about the legislative powers of the governor. Right. The governor summons the legislati legislature and the chief minister communicates the decisions and the legislative proposals to the governor. So, article 167 and 168 are similar. 167 talks about the administrative aspects and 168 talks about the legislative aspects. Similarly, 169, parliament may create and abolish legislative council of a state. So, we will uh, discuss tomorrow when we discuss the state legislature, legislature, we will discuss in some detail about the state legislative councils. Okay, so article 169 says the parliament, the power of parliament to create a state legislative council. So similarly, the parliament also can dissolve the state legislative council. Right. So these are some of the important articles about the state government. Right. Now we will understand the powers of the state government. What are the powers that are given to the state government? Right. So basically the state government, they derive their powers directly from the constitution. We have uh, seen just now the seventh schedule. It gives uh, some direct and separate powers to the state government. The constitution employs a threefold distribution. So there are three sets of powers. So one set of uh, power that is state list, the powers mentioned under the state list that are exclusively given to the state government. So right. <coughs> Schedule 4 further categorizes these three powers into lists. That is center list. Uh, the second one is state list and third one is concurrent list. So defining the scope of scope of jurisdiction for each level of government. So the jurisdiction is uh, defined for each and every aspect when it comes to center and state. So all these powers are listed in the seventh schedule of the constitution. All right. So basically uh, what union list comprises that is list one. So it comprises items over it comprises the items on which the union possesses exclusive powers of legislation. So for the powers mentioned in the list one union list only the center has the right to legislate act upon right so the center has the sole jurisdiction when it comes to these powers right second one is the state list we can also call uh, call uh, call this as list two the exclusive rights are given to the state governments here so it contains basically 59 items originally there were 66 items so uh, during the 42nd constitutional amendment some powers have been taken from here from the state list and they have included in the concurrent list. Alright, so basically the powers like uh, protecting environment etc. Those uh, have been taken from here. Also other power is education. So basically these kind of uh, subjects or items have been taken from the state's list and they have uh, been uh, put, under, uh, put in the concurrent list. 
So originally there were 66 items. Now there are 59 items in the state's list. So here the state has the exclusive legislative jurisdiction, right? So some of the items mentioned here are in the state uh, list are public order, that is law and order, police basically, police, agriculture, public health, sanitation and <coughs> local government. These kind of powers are put in the state's list. So these subjects are vital to the well-being of the people. So these are important powers and are the, uh, these are important for the well-being of the people. So these way the state has the exclusive domain. So basically under specific circumstances, some special cases, in some special cases, the parliament can legislate on these uh, subjects which are given to the state government. We will see what are those special circumstances. First is national interest. So under the national, national interest banner, the council of states that is Rajya Sabha can pass a special resolution. The special resolution that uh, the, with the, through the special resolution, the Rajya Sabha pass a, through the special majority, uh, the Rajya Sabha can pass a resolution saying that uh, this particular item is of national importance. So the parliament can, uh, can uh, make a law on this item. So that kind of legislation or resolution will be valid for one year. And parliament can make a law on that particular item. Right. <coughs> so this is one aspect where Rajya Sabha passes a uh, resolution with special majority. Second one is emergency proclamation. So during the proclamation of emergency, Parliament is empowered to legislate on state subjects, right? Third one is consent of the states. So whenever two or more uh, states come to the come together, and if they pass a resolution that a common law should be uh, passed for them uh, on a certain uh, on a certain item that is mentioned in the state list, so then also the Parliament may legislate on a state subjecting concerning all those states. Right. Similarly, another ground is to implement the international agreements. Whenever government of India concludes an agreement with a foreign power, I mean with a different country, to implement that agreement also, uh, the parliament can make a law including the items mentioned in the uh, state list. So there also the parliament has the power to uh, act upon the items mentioned in the state list. Similarly, constitutional missionary uh, failures so basically this is the president's rule during the president's rule when state emergency is imposed so <coughs> president uh, may declare that powers of the state legislature shall be exercised by or under the authority of the parliament so at that time also the parliament has the right to enact on the subjects mentioned in the state's list right so this is the uh, major areas uh, are major grounds on which the parliament can make a law on the items mentioned in the states list. So the third item in the list is the concurrent list. This, uh, this, is, uh, this is list 3. So it comprises basically 52 items. So first there were 47 items uh, I have already told. So some of the items that were mentioned in the states list they have, uh, they have been brought into the concurrent list. So on these lists, both union and state legislatures hold the concurrent jurisdiction, which means both center and state, both can make laws on the items mentioned in this list. So this is basically the concurrent jurisdiction. Some of the aspects mentioned here are criminal law, criminal procedure, marriage, education, civil procedure, insurance, etc. So basically education earlier was in state list uh, in the 42nd amendment through the 42nd amendment act education was brought into uh, uh, concurrent list. Similarly another example was environment. environment. So try to remember these facts they may be asked in the examination. So basically this uh, union both union and the states have authority to 
legislate on the subjects mentioned in the concurrent list. So, however, the union legislature is given primacy here, more importance here. So basically, whenever there is a conflict between the union and the state law, so both union and the states both have, have enacted a law on these on the same subject, the same item mentioned in the uh, concurrent list. The union law, the law made by the union, it prevails. Right. So whenever there is a dispute or uh, there is a challenge between the law made by the state and the center, so basically the law made by the union government or central government that prevails. Repugnancy of state law, however, uh, so when there is a contest or challenge between the laws made by the center and the states on the concurrent list, so the union law will hold the primacy. However, if the president, a particular law is made by the state government and the governor, respective governor, holds or reserves that particular bill or law passed by state legislature for the consideration of the president. Yes, yesterday we have seen that the governor has the discretion power to reserve a particular bill passed by the state legislative assembly for the consideration of the president. So in certain circumstances, in those circumstances, if the president gives his assent to that particular uh, bill passed by the state government, so that law, the start, uh, state law may prevail for the time being. However, if the parliament still passes another law, okay, then that state law will ceases to exist. So by subsequent legislation, the central government can have uh, can have its say in the when it comes to the concurrent list. So this is the takeaway point here. Right. Right. So disputes regarding the interpretation of entries in the three lists, these will be resolved by the courts. Yeah, we have understood this. So basically this is one of the federal principles. Right. So basically here to I mean to address the issues or dispute, disputes between the lawmaking power of the parliament and the state legislature. So the judiciary will employ the principle of doctrine of pith and substance. So basically it is used to decide the jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. Whether a particular act is crossing the jurisdiction. Uh, given to the whether the state government or the central government. So whenever it feels that the I mean the state or the center has the authority to or the grounds to make laws if that law is crossing some periphery also there is no problem. So basically this doctrine will be used to uh, decide that one. So whenever uh, the judiciary feels that the state or the center has the requisite uh, grounds or necessity to make a particular law, even it is crossing some boundaries, some jurisdiction, so the judiciary will uphold the law under the doctrine of pith and substance. So please try to remember this aspect. When we discuss main aspects, we will go into some more detail and we will see these kinds of doctrines in some more detail. Right. <coughs> So these are some of the aspects about the distribution of powers between the center, state and uh, the three items, the states list, the centers list and the concurrent list. Now we will understand the some aspects about the state council of ministers, right. So though the executive power is wielded on the name of the governor, <coughs> the real power exists in the council of ministers and uh, which is headed by the chief minister. Right. So, uh, the council or uh, the governor must have a council of minister to aid and advise uh, in the day-to-day -day administration of the state government. However, some discretionary functions remain with the governor. Yeah, we have understood this one. The governor has certain discretionary powers. So, majority of the power, majority of the executive power is effectively exercised by the council of ministers only. Right. Appointment <coughs> and dismissal of the Council of Ministers. So the Council of Ministers is appointed by the Governor based on the advice of Chief Minister. We have also understood this aspect. So this practice is 
coincides with the practice practice at the central level so basically the governor appoints ministers whose whose names have been recommended by the chief minister similarly the ministers hold the office of the office at the pleasure of the governor <coughs> sorry practically they hold the office during the pleasure of the chief ministers because directly the names have been recommended by the chief minister himself so whenever the chief minister recommend the governor to remove or suspend a particular minister uh, the governor has to follow this aspect and he has to remove that particular minister so in practically for all practical purposes the ministers hold the office during the pleasure of the chief minister so basically we also see the <coughs> there is a classification of ministers uh, at the central level also we have seen this uh, classification so there will be cabinet cabinet ministers there will be uh, there will be ministers of state and there will be deputy ministers so the hierarchy also follows the same uh, order so first uh, the cabinet ministers they have the higher authority next uh, state state ministers and next deputy ministers are there to help both the ministers of state and the cabinet ministers so this is the order of the ministers and there is a limitation on the number of ministers so through the 91st amendment act 91st constitutional amendment act the, there is a limit has been put by the constitution itself so the total number of ministers including the chief ministers that should not that number should not exceed 15% of the total members of the state legislative assembly so this is uh, this principle is there for center also in the center also the total number of ministers including the prime minister that should not that number should not exceed the uh, total members of the lok sabha so same principles also applies here so similarly uh, we have seen a committee system at the central level and we have seen two or three important committees when it comes to matters of finance at the when we were studying the central government here also the committee system is there however the cabinet committee system that is more prominent and more open at the central level so at the state levels it is not that much predominant so try to remember this difference however the popularity of that cabinet committees may also differ from state to state one state to another state so please try to remember this difference <coughs> next division of uh, work into departments at the state level so basically we can ca also call this as ministerial positions and uh, up after ministries uh, several departments also will be there so all these divisions have been made for the effective management of management of, or implementation of the uh, schemes and effective management or effective implementation of the administration so for that purpose division of work has been made and work has been uh, divided into certain departments at the state le uh, state level so according to according to the doctrine of ministerial responsibility the council of ministers are collectively responsible to the state legislative assembly so this is there so but for administ administrative convenience earlier the decisions have been taken by the uh, all the council of ministers together however however as the time passed by uh, the administrative system has become lot of complex i mean uh, it has become a lot complex so the individual ministers are started taking decisions uh, however they have to implement the or uh, follow the principle of principle of collective responsibility collective responsibility so the take away point here is though there is division of work uh, through the departments and a particular minister overseeing a particular ministry or a particular de uh, uh, department 
he is solely taking the decisions uh, pertaining to the department or ministry he has to he or she has to uphold the principle of uh, collective responsibility and he has also collectively responsibilities whatever decisions have been taken by the individual ministers right so this is the takeaway point from here so similarly uh, under article 1663 uh, the governor can make rules for the efficient ex uh, execution of the administrative process so similarly under the allocation of business rules uh, the responsible be, uh, responsibilities will be divided among the ministers right so based on the allocation of business rules the responsibilities will be given to each and every individual ministers right so on what basis this division of uh, work will be decided so uh, the some of the grounds are like geography geographical conditions or geographical divisions or clientele and functions so based on in combination of all these aspects also the seniority of the particular minister will be considered so all these uh, through all these aspects based on all these grounds the division of work will be uh, done right so sim similarly the personal considerations of the chief minister the close in, uh, closeness of a particular minister uh, to the chief minister and also the position of the particular minister or the person in the political party in the ruling party these factors will also come into consideration whenever the ministerial positions are considered and the division of work is being done right right so however although the ministers are exercising their, their power independently some aspects have to be brought before the chief ministers and they are they should be put before the chief ministers whenever there are some important aspects so uh, while presenting that uh, uh, aspect or decision to the chief minister the minister may record his her her recommendations while submitting that particular file to the chief ministers so whenever it comes to important aspects the particular minister has to take the opinion of the chief ministers so while submitting the file the minister may record his recommendations right this aspect is there so in certain aspects coordination is required among the ministers uh, when uh, we have understood that there is division of work between the ministers however there is coordination required coordination required among the ministers so the principles i mean the aspect the the situations where the coordination is required are required is important policy matters whenever there are aspects of important policy matters the coordination among the ministers is has to be achieved and has to be there and a meeting of cabinet ministers will be held for that purpose cabinet meetings meetings will be held for that purpose so the procedure basically is laid laid down for here uh, how to conduct the cabinet meetings and how the results uh, the disputes uh, whatever they are there to be resolved and uh, coordination has to be achieved so basically what this aspect is saying is there is division of power for effective implementation or for effective administration however uh, when it comes to important policy aspects coordination is required among the ministers and that is uh, that coordination will be achieved through the cabinet meetings right so now we will see the size of council of ministers and uh, composition we have understood that there is a 15 percent cap on the number of ministers number of ministers however the second administrative reforms commission it recommended that uh, basically the cap has been suggested or put to achieve efficiency efficiency so before that uh, 91 uh, 91st amendment act what was happening is due to political compulsions the chief minister had to include more and more number of uh, people who are kind of influential within the political party as ministers 
right so i mean cases have arisen like so the ministers were there ministers were there but there are no ministries for them there are no ministries for them so there were ministers for name say to fulfill the individual ambitions and because of these reasons the efficiency of administration efficiency of administ administration has been impacted a lot so address to this address this aspect to address the issue of uh, uh, efficiency that particular cap has been put 15% cap has been put put however through even through this amendment also the desired efficiency could we could not brought in that uh, desired uh, desired efficiency so the issue is still there uh, even the ministry there is a limit on the number of ministers to be present in a in, uh, government still the we are unable to achieve that efficiency so similarly the second administrative reforms commission also suggested a tentative range of 10% to 15% uh it also suggested a cap on the number of ministers from 10% to uh, 15% as we can understand for when it comes to delhi administration of delhi so basically the ministers the number of ministers should not exceed 10% of the total membership of the legislative assembly of the delhi so for nct delhi there is a separate limit so basically the second administrative reforms commission has suggested a range of 10% to 15% to achieve efficiency in the administration and the division of powers right now we will try and understand the role of the chief minister when it comes to the state government so basically the role is similar to that of the prime minister at the union level so the role of the chief minister is similar to that of the prime minister at the union level so basically he wields the real executive power because the council of minister headed by him the chief minister uh, is uh, there to aid and advise the governor in uh, day to day administration of the particular state so basically he is the real he wields the real executive power so basically he is appointed uh, appointed by the governor and he serves the term during the uh, pleasure of the governor so here the chief minister's role becomes very very important whenever uh, there is a single political party wielding special majority in the state legislative assembly so we can understand from this that he will become the de facto authority authority at the state level right so he becomes the de facto authority at the state level for all practical purposes so now we will understand the powers of the chief minister with respect to council of ministers so as the leader of the council of ministers he assigns and can change the port portfolios among the ministers so it is his will to allocate and a change the ministries to particular ministers so he also coordinates the functioning of council of ministers ensuring there is a coordination and a coherence in the decisions taken by the council of ministers also he sets the agenda for the meetings of the cabinet <coughs> also he significantly influences the decisions that are that are being taken by the cabinet similarly he holds the power to dismiss ministers at will and also alter their portfolios because we have understood that on the only on the recommendation of the chief minister only the uh, the governor appoints the ministers similarly on the recommendation of the chief minister the governor can remove the ministers so he holds the power of dismissing the ministers and also changing their portfolios their ministries right so basically he is the leader for the council of ministers similarly we understand the powers in relation to the governor so however the constitution uh, do not directly say about the powers power balance between the uh, 
governor and the chief ministers earlier we have understood that uh, the chief minister has to uh, inform the governor about the decisions uh, administrative decisions taken by the council of ministers and moreover the governor can also inquire about the administrative aspects uh, through the chief minister so he the governor can inquire the chief ministers about the administration of a particular state right so the chief minister is conventionally he is expected to consult and uh, inform the governor about the administrative aspects about the state so, however uh, the chief minister indirectly exercises the power uh, over the governor's public appearances and uh, speeches because uh, we have understood the principle that the governor has to act only on the aid and advice of the council of ministers that is headed by the chief minister so indirectly the chief minister exercises uh, power over the appearance public appearances of the governor and also his speeches right similarly we understand the powers related to the chief ministers power related to the uh, state legislature so basically the chief minister serves as the leader of the state legislative assembly so he is the legislative he uh, holds the real legislative leaders uh, leadership by setting the legislative agenda what particular acts have to be passed in the state legislative assembly right 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 <clears throat> he also keeps the assembly informed about the government initiative through the mechanism of questions questions answering statements and the laying down papers such as white papers etc so the governor uh, the chief ministers keeps in uh, keep, keeps the legislative assembly informed about the administrative developments or the administrative uh, decisions that have taken for the administration of the particular state now we will understand the powers related to personnel personnel means government officials government employees or officials or bureaucrats so he controls the entire administrative system and entire bureaucracy as the political executive as the political head of the government so entire state bureaucracy will be under the control of the chief minister he is the polit political head for the entire bureaucracy he also approves the senior appointments including the appointment of chief secretary and uh, he oversees the service conditions of all the employees within the territory of the state so basically he has the <coughs> total control when it comes to the bureaucracy of the state government similarly he also provides leadership to the bureaucracy and improves works for improving their morale in discharging the duties of the uh, i mean discharge discharging their particular duties for the better governance of the state all right similarly he monitors the performance of the performance of the bureaucrats and uh, through various administrative channels like uh, party workers uh, complaints etc so he also monitors the uh, efficiency or work of the all the bureaucrats so these are the some of the relation uh, some of the aspects of uh, the relationship of the chief minister with the different authorities like governor council of ministers and bureaucracy etc so now we will understand the position of the chief chief secretary so basically when it comes to state administration uh, the position of chief secretary secretary this becomes very very important so basically this position is akin to the uh, cabinet secretary cabinet secretary at the central level right <laughs> so basically so every state uh, has a chief secretary he will he, he he is the linchpin of the state secretariat he is the most important person when it comes to the state secretariat so he exerts control over the uh, state secretariat so he is the most important uh, person when it comes to the state bureaucracy 
so basically he is not just a primus inter pares so primus inter pares means first among the equals equals so basically there will be many number of secretaries uh, basically they will be overseeing each and every ministry each department or ministry is supervised by a particular secretary however the chief secretary he is not just the first among the equals first among the all secretaries he is the chief among the secretaries i mean he is the head of the all secretaries head for all secretaries so he holds important powers when it comes to the bureaucracy or the uh, i mean uh, state servants state government servants right right the roles of the chief secretary include we will see the roles that are given to the chief secretary so when we see all these roles we will come to know about the importance of the chief secretary so he is advi advisor to uh, to the chief ministers and he is secretary to the state cabinet <coughs> so basically he is the chief advisor to the chief ministers and also he is the head of the state cabinet i means whatever the uh, the ministers are actually advised or uh, i mean assisted by the state ca state secretariat state secretariat is there to assist the ministers and uh, he is the chief secretary he is the head of this secretariat similarly he is the, the chief secretary is the head of the general administration department so the basically uh, the chief minister is the political head for the general administration department and uh, the chief secretary is the uh, i mean the uh, bureaucratic head for this general administration department so basically through this position he exercises influence over crucial administrative matters right similarly he is the head of the state civil services uh there is a question about this particular aspect when it uh, when it comes to cabinet secretary there was a question in the prelims examination so please try to the, uh, remember these kinds of aspects so as the head of the civil services at the state level so he wields authority in decisions regarding civil service civil, civil servants postings and transfers so basically he is the head of the civil services at the state level and uh, through that position he holds important decision making power when it comes to the posting and transfers of the other civil servants in the state next he is the communication channel between the state government and the state, central government and also among the state governments between one state and the other state so he is the main communication channel between the central government and that particular state and also when communicating with the other state right he is the spokesman spokesperson and the public relations office officer of that particular state so particular state he is the chief spokesperson and uh, public relations officer of that particular state so he is excluded from the tenure system so what this means this means there is no particular tenure defined tenure for the chief secretary means uh the chief secretary has to resign after serving as 2 years or 3 years etc so there is no particular rule uh for the position of the chief secretary so basically chief secretary's office exempted from the tenure system there is no particular tenure defined a person can remain in the uh, that position for any long time for practical purposes so basically the person who is appointed as the chief secretary he will retire from that position retires from that position right in some cases he will move to the union government for taking up the higher further higher position so the reason behind this is the position of secretary he is highest position highest position that that a civil servant can achieve when it comes to the administration of the state so because of these reasons the a person holding the chief secretary's position he will be generally he will retire from that position only so standardization after 1973 after 
there were some efforts to standardize the position of the chief secretary so now the position of he the chief secretary is given the rank of secretary to the government of india secretary to the government of india and the service conditions and uh, emoluments will be equal to equal to that of the secretaries to the government of india right <coughs> uh, similarly we will understand the impact on the position of the chief secretary when president's role is imposed in a state when president's role is imposed so his position changes changes significantly uh, significantly so basically the role of the chief secretary undergoes a significant changes so there will be significant transfer transformation uh, in the position of the chief secretary so basically uh, in earlier classes we have understood that whenever uh, the president's rule is imposed <coughs> the government at the state level will be dismissed and there will be two senior civil servants ias officers will be two officers will be appointed to advise the or assist assist the governor in discharging the administrative duties we also have understood that the governor starts taking more direct role in the administration whenever the president's role is imposed <coughs> so whenever the absence of the, these two officers whenever these two advise uh, two officers are not appointed to assist the governor the chief secretary assumes the functions belonging to the chief minister so the chief secretary starts exercising those powers right however whenever these uh, two advisors are appointed so the chief uh, secretary will assume somewhat assume a somewhat somewhat uh, sub, sub, subsumed role i mean somewhat lesser role so try to remember this aspect that whenever president's role is imposed the uh, role of the chief uh, chief uh, secretary undergoes lot of transformation all right so basically we will try to understand the functions of the chief secretary the position of the secretary uh, chief secretary so basically the functions are similar to the roles just before we have discussed but mostly these points will overlap so he is basically the advisor to the chief ministers we have understood uh, understood this aspect he is the secretary to the cabinet so he works as the head of the cabinet and he is the head of the civil services and through this power he wields lot of power in the transfers and service con conditions of the civil servants of the state and he is the coordinator in chief of secret secretariat departments right and uh, <coughs> committee responsibilities so he presides over many number of committees at the special uh, state level and uh, he holds membership in many other communities uh, because of his position as the chief secretary similarly he assumes the uh, secretaryship of the zonal council by rotation so basically zonal councils are there to improve the relations between the state governments so basically he uh, the chief secretary assumes the uh, secretaryship of the zonal council particular zonal council in which the state gone a state is placed by rotation right similarly he has lot of administrative control he is the leader of the bureaucracy he is the <coughs> bureaucratic head of the uh, government uh, at the state level right similarly during the crisis management whenever there is a crisis like situation in the state he assumes the leadership and he becomes the nerve center for taking all the important decisions to oversee that particular crisis situation so he also provides leadership and guidance to expedite, expedite uh, relief measures to oversee disasters like disasters like floods cyclones so any crisis situation is there his leadership becomes very very important and all the decisions will uh, flow from that particular position chief secretary position so basically uh this is the uh, some of the important information which i thought will be helpful to you so here i focused more on the aspects of the chief minister 
and the chief secretary when we were discussing the union aspects union government i could not focus more on the cabinet secretary part cabinet secretary part i could not focus more uh, because of the paucity of time so basically i try i try to cover here more about the chief secretary so basically you try to find a similarity between the positions of chief secretary and the cabinet secretary so basically the powers are similar at the union level and the state level so try to draw uh, draw some similarities and whenever there is a question you try to use this knowledge to answer particular questions you try to relate the positions like a uh, position of governor and the president position of the prime minister and the chief minister and similarly the position of the chief secretary and the cabinet sec uh, secretary so basically the aspects will be similar the powers and the functions will be similar All right so in this way uh, we uh, are coming to a point that we are comprehensively covering the uh, central administration and the state administration tomorrow we will discuss the state legislative assembly state legislative assembly so with this we will come to uh, we will end the central government part and uh, state government part so in this way we can we can come to a picture that we have uh, completed the major aspects in the polity subject so this will give you a comprehensive idea as to how the questions can be asked uh, questions can be answered whenever the questions are asked from this area right so we will see uh, one or two questions that are asked previously from this uh, part first question it is asked in 2017 the question is which of the following are not necessarily the uh, consequences of proclamation of president's rule in a state so basically whenever the president's rule is uh, imposed what are the not, what are, i mean which of the below are not the necessary consequences the first one is dissolution of state legislative assembly second option is removal of the council of ministers and uh, dissolution of the local bodies so whenever the president's rule is imposed the state uh, there is no need for dissolving the state legislative assembly it can exist removal of the council of ministers at the state so yes this happens whenever the president's rule is imposed in a state the government the council of ministers has to be uh, dismissed there so this has to happen certainly dissolution of local bodies there is no not at all need for this so option becomes one and three so whenever state uh, president's rule is imposed in a state there is no need for dissolving the state legislative assembly similarly there is no need for dissolving the local bodies so answer is b one and three second question is consider the following statements it is asked in 2016 uh the chief secretary uh, in a state is appointed by the governor of the state right second statement is the chief secretary in a state has fixed tenure so basically this uh, statement is wrong because just now we have seen that the tenure system is not applicable to chief secretary right there is no fixed tenure for the chief secretary so this statement is incorrect similarly the first statement the chief secretary if uh, in a state is appointed by the governor of a state so this is also wrong the chief secretary is appointed by the chief minister so this statement is also wrong so answer is neither one nor two answer is d so this is all for today uh, thank you thank you for joining the lecture uh, see you tomorrow